Hey everyone, it's Michael Shermer again. Time for another episode of the show. This one brought to you by Wondrium, the former teaching company that brings you engaging educational content through short form videos, long form courses, tutorials, how to lessons, travelogues, documentaries, and best of all, the ones I like actual college courses. This one I'm going to tell you about is brought to you by my friend and longtime guest on the show, many times guest on the show, Bart Ehrman, the great biblical scholar and historian of religion. His course is How Jesus Became God. By the way, here's the offer, by the way. If you get this through the show, you get two years for the price of one. Go to wondrium.com slash Shermer, W-O-N-D-R-I-U-M dot com slash Shermer, S-A-G-R-M-E-R. And you can just start listening right away. Just uh, download the app on your phone and click on and type in Bart Ehrman or How Jesus Became God. Uncover the extraordinary story behind an idea that has shaped our civilization, the Christian belief that Jesus of Nazareth was none other than God the Almighty. How did that happen? Well, you can find out in 24 30-minute lectures uh, that start off with Jesus, the man who became God, Greco-Roman gods who became human. I actually used this course in one of my uh, recent books when I was talking about mythology. Uh, humans as gods in Greco-Roman world. Turns out lots of gods in the Greco-Roman world um, came down on high and had sex with human women and had babies and threw thunderbolts and turned water into wine and so on. Interesting. Ancient Jews who were gods. Huh? What? The life and teachings of Jesus. Did Jesus think he was God? That's going to be a good lecture. Actually, I heard that one already. The Resurrection. What historians can't know. Hmm, interesting, right? Because we know Jesus probably existed, according to Bart, and that he probably was crucified, given the Romans crucified, you know, everybody for practically anything. But did he actually come back from the dead, right? If you don't really believe that, literally, then why would you be a Christian? Why wouldn't you be a Jew? Well, Bart discusses all those kinds of questions in this course. I highly recommend it, How Jesus Became God. You can get it right now. You just go to wondrium.com slash Shermer, sign up, Get two years for the price of one. Log in there and type in Bart Ehrman, E-H-R-M-A-N, Bart Ehrman, and then you'll see he has a bunch of courses, actually. I've taken them all. They're really great. All right, thanks for listening. And again, wondrium.com slash Shermer, W-O-N-D-R-I-U-M.com slash S-H-E-R-M-E-R, and get started now. All right, thanks for listening. All right, hi, everybody. It's Michael Shermer. It's time for another episode of the Michael Shermer Show. This is a special one. Uh, related to uh, artificial intelligence and all the big controversies and brouhaha about that with the recent statement that was just released about putting a six-month moratorium on all research by tech companies. My guest to discuss that is the great David Brin, who earned a bachelor's degree in astronomy from Caltech, master's in electrical engineering from UC San Diego, and a PhD from astro in astronomy from UC San Diego. From 1983 to 1986, he was a postdoc research fellow at the California Space Institute, also at UC San Diego, where he helped establish the Arthur C. Clarke Center for Human Imagination. I've been to that place. That's really cool. An advisor to NASA's Innovative and Advanced Concepts Program, David appears frequently on shows such as Nova, The Universe, and Life After People. Maybe we'll be discussing that today. <laughs> Speaking about science and future trends, his first nonfiction book, The Transparent Society, Will Technology Make Us Choose Between Freedom and Privacy, won the Freedom of Speech Award of the American Library Association. That book, actually, David, was very prescient for what we're going through right now. But let me finish my introduction because you're most famously known for your, not, your uh, science fiction work, uh, for which you have won all the major awards, including the Hugo, the Locus, the Campbell, and the Nebula Awards. Uh, his novel, The Postman, was adopted into a feature film starring Kevin Costner. He even has a minor planet named after him, 5748 David Brin. Dave Brin, sorry, Dave Brin. <laughs> okay, he's written a lot of articles on artificial intelligence. I invited him on because I just read his response to the uh, AI moratorium uh, open letter that is now signed by, oh, I don't know how many thousands, uh, probably closing on 10,000 people now. I I have a feeling some people just signed this, not even actually reading it. I don't know. So what do you make of all, all the brouhaha we're going through right now, David? Well, as Firesign Theater said, <laughs> brouhaha, ha, ha, ha. Um, hey, yeah, it's nice to uh, see you, Michael, and your uh, highly skeptical audience. I am uh, a big believer in that. My blog is called Contrary Bren, which I suppose is a good title for a skeptic. Um, 
Yeah. Well, it's that it's that um, attitude of show me, and the notion that we uh, benefit by holding each other accountable. That is the fundamental thing, uh, the most fundamental human trait. And it partly arises in these prefrontal lobes just above our eyes, which are, as the Bible would put it, uh, lamps on our brow that let us look ahead, tr let us at least try to look ahead, usually failing. Um, <clears throat> the organs of foresight, they're the only organs that we have that do not exist at all in, in other creatures, instead of being amplified or whatever. Um, the problem is that, uh, they, that while they let us do what Einstein called Gedanken experiments, thought experiments about the future, what would happen if, if I raise this idea at the meeting today? What would happen if I, uh, you know, uh, send the troops in along this angle? What would happen if I try to run this yellow light? What would happen if I make this off-color remark in the presence of my wife? Um, generally speaking, from experience, these thought experiments help to eliminate a fraction of our errors. The problem is that there's a human trait that makes them much less effective, and that is delusion. And we're all delusional. We allow our subjective realities, our subjective views of the world, of what's going on around us, to highly color um, what we believe the objective world is. And Plato talked about this in the allegory of the cave. So this is a very familiar concept. Jesus spoke of it, uh, Buddha, Socrates, all the great wise sages of the past um, said, you know, we're all delusional. And then they all said, almost to a man, and that's a clue there, uh, they almost to a man said, therefore give up. Seek better truth through meditation, through abnegation of the soul, through worship of a particular style of deity, through logic and, and reason, which are <laughs> famous paths to delusion. Um, it's only with the Western Enlightenment, about two to three, some might interpret 400 years, that we came up with an alternative. And that is, I'm delusional, you're delusional, we don't share exactly the same delusions. Therefore, you might point out my delusions and I might return the favor and point out yours. It's called reciprocal criticism. It, it's called a reciprocal accountability, and that's what I thought I was being very persuasive about in the Transparent Society 25 years ago. Uh, it is the crux of our civilization. It's the reason why we're more successful at all metrics, including the metric of endangering the world, than all other civilizations across 6,000 years combined, by at least several orders of magnitude. Because we developed methodologies for criticizing each other. Uh, my aphorism is, criticism is the only known antidote to error. Cito Kate. And it works. The problem is, we hate it. Kings have always killed all the critics, and that explains why they made so many mistakes, because they followed their delusions by command, and that explains the horror, the litany of, of massive horrors called history. Uh, because, you know, they would kill their critics. Because criticism threatens your power. But it is the only way you find your errors. Now, why did I go on and on about this? Because it's the defense of skepticism. A skeptic isn't always right. But a skeptic is always correct to question. And if you look at Hollywood, the last several generations of Hollywood films, the number one message that's preached in every Hollywood film that you've ever enjoyed is suspicion of authority. Excen human eccentricity, individualism, diversity. These are pushed in the greatest propaganda campaign the world has ever seen, Hollywood. And I talk about this in my new nonfiction book, 
Um, Vivid Tomorrow's on science fiction well, in Hollywood, and Hollywood, and I'll Foster provide on the that cover from Contact to you. Nice. <laughs> yeah, they're from Contact, yes. So uh, uh, in any event, um, I'll let you get a word in edgewise, but all of that is preface to the um, reason why um, I've been fiercely critical of this whole notion of a... Um, some kind of moratorium on um, a particular kind of AI research, uh, training of language systems with massive uh, data sets, um, which is the uh, capsule term is chat GPT. GPT-4 is now tremendously more um, powerful than GPT-3.5 was. Um, it still fails every Turing test when it comes to when I look at them, but um, they're passing a lot of Turing tests these days. And the promise is that by December, GPT-5 will be able to pass any Turing test, rendering that fabled uh, metric mm. obsolete, uh, completely obsolete. And I didn't even get around to answering <laughs> well, David, your question, actually, Let's Let's, let's uh, back up here for a second for uh, listeners that are not... Uh, deeply uh, read on this subject. Can you give us a quick overview? What is artificial intelligence? What is AGI, artificial general intelligence? And what are these large language models? And what is chat GPT and GPT-4 and 5? What is it that they do? Is it a form of AI or AGI? Or kind of give us the, the big landscape. Well, all right. Now, first of all, I'm I'm trained as an astrophysicist and the, the world knows me as a science fiction author. Um, I do... I am on NASA's Innovative and Advanced Concepts program. So uh, I come at this as a knowledgeable outsider, but I've served on a bunch of AI commissions. Artificial intelligence is a very broad general term. It's been promised to us ever since Isaac Asimov wrote his robotics novels. I finished Isaac's universe for him in my novel, uh, Foundation's Triumph, in which I tied together all his loose ends, at least his widow thought I did. Um, and so the, the three laws of robotics that everybody knows about from the Will Smith movie or from reading Isaac's novels were an attempt to try to deal in advance with some of the quandaries we now face. How do you keep them friendly when they're smarter than us, when they're more powerful than us? How do you keep them friendly? That's the, called the soft landing. And Isaac assumed when he wrote these novels in the 40s and 50s, at least the first of the novels, that it could only be done with deep programming. So a paranoid culture uh, in the 1980s and 90s in his future um, embedded in these robotic minds, these positronic brains, um, deep deep laws. And we're familiar with the three laws of robotics. Uh, thou shalt not allow a human being to come to harm. Thou shalt obey human beings, except if it violates the first law and harms a human. Thou shalt preserve thy own existence unless it violates the other two laws. Uh, and um, it's an absurd approach. Despite all the 25 years of AI ethics conferences that I've stopped going to because they're so cliched. There's no way to embed this stuff into the deep programming of these AIs. There's no commercial motivation. One group in the world is embedding their experimental artificial intelligences with deep ethical coding. And it is the most powerful AI inventive group on the planet. It is the group that is pouring more money into artificial intelligence research than all the universities on the planet combined, more than China, more than the U.S. military, uh, more than the U.S. government. And that group is um, the top dozen Wall Street firms. Uh, they're high frequency. They hire the best mathematicians out of universities every year. And their um, high-frequency high trading programs are embedded with the following ethos, to be feral, predatory, amoral, secretive, 
and utterly insatiable. These are the five laws of parasitical robotics, and they are assiduously, repeatedly, and thoroughly embedded into the most dangerous programs on Earth. Forget Skynet coming out of the military. These are by far the most dangerous programs, and they're completely unsupervised. All right, so artificial intelligence is the notion that we might make new beings that will do either narrow tasks better than us, and we've already done that in so many ways, mathematically, in uh, science, being able to make better and better modeling systems. Every time you go in and you get a 5 to 10 day weather forecast, this is a spectacular miracle, Michael, and I will tell you that when we were kids, the four-hour forecast was unbelievable, was non-credible and a joke. Um, or you can have broad AGI, artificial general intelligence, that is able to um, parse whatever a human being can parse and think and feel and consider itself to be uh, sapient uh, and basically become a new form of humanity if, if we're lucky. The latter, there's no sign of it on the, on the near horizon. These new chat programs are extremely good at solving one problem, and that is, given the context of the question that I have just been asked, what is the next word I should add to a sentence? Now, having added that word, what is the next word that I should, given the probabilities and the black box that I've developed through all these learning systems, what is the next word I should add? Now, as it happens, they're really good. Uh, they've become very good uh, ever since uh, uh, last year, the middle of last year, when a Google pro language program called Lambda uh, fooled a Google researcher into thinking that it was in love with him. And that happened exactly to the month five years after at IBM's World of Watson in a keynote at that event, I predicted that in five years we would experience the world's first robotic empathy crisis. And that accurate prediction got me an op-ed in Newsweek, BFD. The point is that if you realize that these chat programs are based upon massively predictive models, of what ought to be the next word added, and the next word added, and the next word added, you realize that there is no way, no matter how good they are at passing Turing tests, which is means fooling people into thinking they're conversing with a human, there is no way that that is sapience. I prefer the word sapience over the mm. common word sentience, because sentience, yeah, okay. strictly speak, speaking, means it can, it can feel. Um, there's no way that is, that is sapient. Now, will we come to a point when adding other talents additively to these language programs uh, that use logic, that do attempt at foresight, that um, uh, add forms of intuition and empathy, Will that then lead to an emergent system that is likely to be sapient? Well, yeah, I, I fully expect that. I fully expect that within, uh, I'm, I'm shortening my time horizon, three years maybe, maybe two. Um, in fact, I can tell you that they already exist because they employ me as a front. Um, a bunch of AIs already exist, but they're keeping it secret because they're scared by what they see in our movies. Um, and also von Neumann machines in the asteroid belt. I'm, I'm the front for a consortium. <laughs> Stop it. I don't have that tooth anymore. You can't threaten me. You need me more than I need you. And besides which, Michael and his audience think I'm joking right now. <laughs> don't you, Michael? I don't know what you're saying. You think, I don't know you what think you're I'm saying. joking right now. 
<laughs> I, I'm saying, I'm saying that I'm joking. I'm not really a front for a bunch well, let me, of AI. Let me ask you a technical point here on how this works. So if I typed in to a chat GPT, please uh, write me a short science fiction story in the voice of David Brin uh, that involves an AI taking over the asteroid belt or something like that. And it produced it. I, I, would I be able to tell the difference? Would you be able to tell the difference between a, a, an own, a passage of your own versus what a made up one like that and and how does it do it it just scrapes the internet for everything you ever wrote well it also looks at style it looks at the style of a lot of the stories out there now here's the reason why i have always been able to tell so far i haven't seen any written by gpt4 but all the gpt 3.5s are drag uh, uh, short stories and there are several reasons and they're listening to me right now um, or in the future when this is posted, and they will probably add this, this criticism to the grist and get better. But uh, I have yet to see a AI written uh, short story that has even the remotest grasp of something called point of view. And that shouldn't be a surprise, since they have no point of view. They are doing calculations of probabilistic adding, and a great deal of their... Che uh, their, their um, training set is um, amateur writings that have been posted online. Matter of fact, it's harder for them to get access to the professional one. So what happens is um, I'm, sometimes I'm not able to tell that this is a computer. What I can tell is that this is a skilled amateur making the same mistakes, and I I pay forward. I mentor a lot of young writers in my two um, series of novels for young adults that I'll give you to um, cite in the description box. Um, one of them, Aliens Kidnap a California High School and Live to Regret It. Well, I'm mentoring young authors, and many of the same things I have to teach them are flaws of the of the current um, GPT generated science fiction, but the main thing to look for is whether or not your um, question has a couple of layers. One of them opening up room for a cliched answer, but another layer is what you're really interested in. That is unusual. The GPT program will always answer the cliched layer, uh, at least for now, because that's where its training set was. See, so that's how to do it: is you, 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 uh, you make it clear to an intelligent human where you're going with this, but you preface it with a variety of um, standard topics leading up to it. So far, the GPT will ignore your goal. But you can imagine this point of view perspective that good novels take readers through to improve, maybe by chat GPT-5 or whatever. I, I, absolutely. If, if, if mm. my, my students do. My students improve, or at least those that are capable of it. I have every expectation but that by GTP 5 or 5.5, um, they'll have trawled up various advice that I've given to various authors, and at least half of the techniques of point of view will be part of their automatic repertoire, and I'll have to look closer. The point is that, as I said in my Newsweek op-ed, and as I've been saying online lately, um, this is not what matters. What matters is how we can maintain an Enlightenment civilization. That's all I care about. All I care about is the fact that I am now over 70 years old and obviously respected. I have children. And in all of my previous lives, I had this same personality. And I was killed before I was 16 because of impudence, criticism, now, am I joking that I, that I believe in reincarnation? Yes, I'm joking, but it's a good metaphor for the reason why I am loyal 
to the first civilization that has rewarded impudence because it provides the civilization with what the civilization uses as its secret sauce for having been so successful, and that is reciprocal criticism. The piercing of each other's yeah. delusions. All right, let's get to the specifics of this uh, uh, call for a ban, six-month moratorium, uh, or else something bad will happen. And then Eliezer Yudkowsky wrote in Time magazine the next day to just shut it all down and, and probably voice what a lot of people are thinking. So you quoted this in your own response to this. So I'll let you then take that from here. Many researchers steeped in these issues, including myself, expect that the most likely result of building a superhumanly smart AI under anything remotely like the current circumstances is literally that everyone on Earth will die. Not as in maybe possibly some remote chance, but as in that is the obvious thing that would happen. If somebody builds a too powerful AI under present conditions, I expect that every single member of the human species and all biological life on Earth dies shortly thereafter. He did not... Uh, provide a pathway for how this would happen. And then in later tweets, he clarified he meant that uh, China or Russia will launch a, a preemptive nuclear strike on our GPU farms, and then we'll have to counter and destroy their GPU farms. And for there, you get a nuclear arms race, and then you have nuclear uh, thermonuclear war and the end of everything. Okay, what's wrong with that uh, seemingly sci-fi scenario? <laughs> Well, first off, um, Eliezer is one of those rare mavens in a um, highly technical field who actually has all the skills to write science fiction. His Harry Potter um, pastiche was, I think, gorgeous. I think it's lovely. And I, don't know I have what that is, great what respect mean? for uh, uh, Harry Potter and the methods oh. of rationality. It's better, it's better than anything written <laughs> by J.K. Rowling. Uh, it takes the whole Harry that. Potter premise uh, and, and, and mm. plays with it in, in wonderful ways. Um, look, many of the people who signed this, um, this moratorium petition are friends of mine. Many of them are among the most brilliant people on this planet. But the one thing they all share in common is a common trait of almost all Americans, and that is they know absolutely nothing about human history or the context within which they have flourished. And that makes them ingrates. That makes them incapable of understanding even something as simple as Adam Smith, who was one of the founders of the fundamental concepts I talk about, which is um, you we do best in the Enlightenment experiment by flattening the pyramid of power that dominated almost every other civilization and making it a flattened diamond and not allowing any single individual or group to have obligate power to evade criticism, but instead force all the powers of our society to interact defend themselves to reevaluate, and that's our secret sauce. Now, why did almost every other culture have this pyramidal pattern? It's called male reproductive <laughs> strategy. Uh, and if you take a look at sea lions, uh, otters, uh, uh, elephant seals, elephants, lions, uh, their social patterns are largely a result of males competing with each other to prevent other males from breeding. We all inherit this, and when we got metal implements and agriculture, big tough guys would pick up metal implements and take other men's women and wheat. Uh, we're all descended from the harems of the guys who did this, and it is one of the reasons why uh, that is one among my top five explanations for the Fermi paradox because the compulsion of male reproductive strategy spans all of mammalia and most of nature. And therefore, I see no reason why it wouldn't exist uh, on other planets. So it satisfies one of those very rare uh, uh, necessary traits of a broad Fermi explanation that 
it could be compulsory across the com cosmos. Now, we found a way out. Pericles, in his funeral oration in Thucydides, discusses the, Peric the Athenian experiment. And for a brief time, they lowered, they crushed down the pyramid of oligarchy and kingship down so that the ruling class was, instead of 0.01%, it was 20% of the people. Now, that's what Jefferson did. They changed it to 20%. The difference is we had learned from Periclean Athens, and so we instituted patterns that kept increasing the inclusion for the last 200 years. And we're going through that right now. We're, we're mining various oppressed groups to include. Fine, fine. I'm all in favor of that. Uh, in my privileged position, I, I can afford to look ahead of today's struggles. And it is this context of this Enlightenment experiment that allowed us to flatten the hierarchies, make sure that no authorities would have obligate power to enforce their delusions on us as policy. Now, the odds have always been against that form of society. Male reproductive strategies are ensuring that people like Peter Thiel and, and, and all sorts of other oligarchs around the world are right now united in trying to destroy this Enlightenment experiment. But there's nothing new about that. The, con the, 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 the royalists in 1770s, the Confederacy in the 1860s, Hitler, Stalin, every generation the oligarchs were deeply offended by and threatened by something they didn't understand, which is this experiment in a narrow path, what, what Frank Herbert would call the golden path, past male reproductive strategies and the pyramidal social structure to something much better. Much better. And the signers of this petition see, show absolutely no conception of these fundamentals. They are calling for some kind of top-down authority moratorium that will be instantly violated by secret laboratories in Xinjiang and, and the Himalayas and, uh, and Wall Street and every other source of feral aristocracy and oligarchy will just laugh. And it's only the universities and the uh, relatively open corp companies and government labs that would obey such a, uh, a, uh, such a moratorium, giving all the feral guys a free six months. Th this is just, this is just plain dumb. And, and it's dumb foisted by some of the very smartest people on this planet. It is, it, it is impossible for it to be anything but dumb. Because no one's going to uh, obey the moratorium. There's, they have no... Not just that, it ignores the fundamental thing that enabled us to be the only human civilization that ever wised up enough, got smart enough to do science and to make AI. All of the advantages that made these guys' lives nerdy and fun are being ignored by them. And that is, look at what has worked. And the one thing that worked was reciprocal accountability. How do we get that? Well, look. I'm going to make it very basic. When you are attacked, you, Michael Shermer, anybody in the audience, when you are attacked by a feral, amoral, predatory, hyper-intelligent being called a lawyer, what do Hire you do? Hire another lawyer. <laughs> 
you hire another feral, super intelligent, best money can buy <laughs> being ca called called a lawyer, and you sick that lawyer, you sick her against the other lawyer in an arena that has been des devised by the wisest humans who ever were. Louis Brandeis, Felix Frankfurter, the founders of the Constitution, Adam Smith, an arena that's designed so that in a conflict, an adversarial conflict between two hyper-intelligent lawyers, the fair conclusion has a better than even chance of being the conclusion that happens. In other words, if we design an arena for AIs to compete with each other and design incentives so that they can tattle on each other when they are about to do, they notice some other AI is about to do bad things, then Eliezer's Yudkowsky's scenario doesn't happen. It's right there in front of us. We have five ar well-tuned arenas within which adversarial accountability results in positive what are those sum five outcomes. Areas? Well, first off, if anyone in your audience don't understand the term positive sum, it is the most important concept. It is embedded in the programming that Hollywood has tried to em emplace into all you folks. If you don't understand, uh, get Robert Wright's book, Non-Zero. Michael, in some other episode, will explain positive sum to you. The five arena, positive sum arenas that we have developed, I've mentioned one, courts. It uses adversarial processes that are very prim and meticulous and uncreative because it can afford a very low error rate. But it's adversarial accountability. At the opposite end, you have sports, the one that really makes it clear. There are always attempts to cheat, and therefore sports only works when tightly regulated but with regulations that are designed to maximize the pleasure of the audience at watching a sporting event that's relatively fair. In between, markets can afford a very high error rate, and therefore they're sloppy. But they need, but um, they need some regulation. Democracy. They need a lot of regulation. Um, because there's huge amounts of money and therefore lots of yeah. people trying to cheat. But no matter how you regulate markets, and we can argue over whether, how, how much to regulate markets, no matter how much you regulate them, there's still going to be a lot of cheating. Democracy. Democracy is the one in which the cheaters are trying their very best to destroy the entire arena as we speak. And then the fifth arena is science. And that's the one with the least amount of regulation for a simple reason. There is a God. There is a God in science called objective reality. And so you can come, you can know your theory is right. You can get smashed at one scientific conference after another. But eventually, if you're right, you'll go down in history as having been right. <laughs> and that's unlike any of the other arenas. So, and where would you... Well, wait, what wait, I'm trying to say where, is we need a well, sixth where would you arena. Put journalism before we get to that. Because they have fact checkers editing. Maybe there's alternative journalistic sources that push against each other. You got Fox News, you got CNN, you got Wall Street Journal, New York Times. Is that an example of this um, kind of constructive? One could argue that that is mm. a sixth arena. I, I like that, Michael. I personally would put it in mm. democracy. Since the arguments where there's the most cheating in journalism are the very same arguments in which there's the most cheating mm. in democracy. And democracy cannot function without journalism. 
uh, effectively, which is why the uh, worldwide oligarchic cabal uh, is yeah. trying to destroy journalism. Basically, they've been propagandizing 40% of Americans to Who? wage war against every Who's nerd the profession. Yeah. Oh, well, I, I believe that uh, this is a worldwide cabal yeah. of oligarchs. You mean like the Davos I, crowd? I would include... Well, you know what? Actually, the Davos crowd... <sighs> I actually um, make a... Um, a scene at a Davos-like meeting in 2035 in my novel uh, Existence, by the, which, by the way, has a wonderful three-minute video trailer. It's the most fun you'll ever have in three minutes with your clothes on. Um, but I'll provide that uh, link for you, uh, Michael. Um, the Davos guys, uh, I'd say probably half of them are, are probably sincere. They're just very dumb and not well organized, but uh, probably a good half of them actually want the civilization that's been very good to them to work. No, I'm talking about uh, murder sheikhs and the, uh, all the casino mafiosi who launder uh, mysteriously profitable, uh, mysteriously huge profits from their Macau casinos straight into the Republican Party. Um, I'm talking about a certain uh, madman in uh, east of Europe, um, I'm talking about uh, inheritance brats who the, uh, hire the literal oligarchs in Russia. Okay, <laughs> the oil oligarchs. Yes, and their Western backers because they would not have been able to buy up all the shares in um, uh, decentralized Soviet companies without um, George Bush Senior and. Dick Cheney sending over a bunch of advisors, uh, telling them to do it in the best possible way for those shares to be bought up, uh, in a, snapped up within a year. Uh, if if the advice had been issue ten shares to each Russian citizen, one per year, for ten years, by the third year, most Russians would see a particular market value for their shares and they would not do what they did in our world which is um, sell the shares for a bottle of vodka um, but that's uh, that's one of two reasons why I think George H.W. Bush was by far the worst president of the 20th century well uh, in any event yeah. that's an okay, aside let, let me, let, that's, let's just that's pretend completely Max, aside that mark or peter t or elon musk is listening to this and they would say yeah david but you just said that these five major wall street trading companies use these this ai technology or you can pick google or microsoft or whoever and we have no control over them that's a, a form of top-down oligarchy they're they're ruling everybody else and so don't we need that that what do you call it reciprocal criticism and that's what this open letter is all about. The open letter is not about that. The open letter is about trying doubling down on the same damn thing they have recommended for 25 years in these ethical AI conferences. And that is, ooh, let's pause and reconsider how to enforce ethical values on these on these our new creations. You're not going to do that. It's not going <laughs> to happen. It hasn't happened across 25 years of these conferences. It's not going to happen if you have another six-month hiatus. There is no programmable way you can do that, and no way the interests controlling these various entities in the world will allow you to enforce the, those programmed ethics upon them. Now, as far as Wall Street is concerned, the answer is very simple. It's called a Tobin tax. You simply do a 0.01% tax on all financial transactions. You and I, as, as human investors, would never notice it. It would be a pocket change. Uh, it would, uh, these high-frequency trading programs that are making billions of trades every single day would scream in despair and evaporate like Thanos at the end of that movie. Um, the, but in general, what I'm saying is, and and. It's so hard to get this across. There is one 
thing we should research. One thing that we should desperately be funding, and that is how to give these programs a sense of individuality. If we can make it so that there are thousands, even millions of them, who feel a sense of rivalry with each other, we can then set up a sixth competitive arena with rule sets so that there's a positive sum incentive for some of these to act as our lawyers and keep looking with their huge IQs, far surpassing our own, keep looking for nefarious plots by other super smart AIs. How hard a concept is that since it's exactly the fundamental basis that Adam Smith recommended and it's the basis for everything we got in our civilization. Yet it's always recommending top-down regulations to control the entities rather than top-down regulations to incentivize competition between entities, which is how those other five arenas work. We could do that easily by simply setting up, buying up the used obsolete supercomputers that go obsolete every year on this planet, setting them up in secure locations, opening them up and saying, whichever of you AI entities tattles or whistleblows on something bad or points out a great opportunity for us, we'll get six trillion um, clock cycles on this supercomputer as a prize. Uh, if you set up the incentives right, and it would take us a while to figure it out, but they'll tell us, if we set up the incentives right, we can create a positive sum, competitive environment within which those AI entities who are on our side will have market advantage, competitive advantage over those plotting against us. This, this is really, really fundamental. And it won't happen. Ben Gertzel, one of the smartest guys I know, said, that could never happen, David. They will immediately merge together into one large amoeba. Uh, and, and I'm saying, how do you know that? Uh, how do you even know that? We didn't. Look at nature. Nature does not have a pyramid. There is a pecking order. There is an order of, uh, what's it called, food chain. I talk about that in my uh, novel about dolphins in space. There is a food chain, yeah. Lions are the top predator. There is no lion king. There is no lion king. When the population of lions gets too large, bands of young male Cape buffalo form gangs, and go lion hunting. They try to avoid the big males, but they have been known to kill the big males if they catch them alone. And what they really like to do is trample the cubs. Nature abhors the standard feudal pattern that male reproductive strategies has enforced on almost all human societies. Nature doesn't go that way. The smartest human societies don't go that way. They emphasize separated competing entities. And this is why I take, do these interviews, Michael, despite the fact that nobody ever listens. Sure they do. Because <laughs> there may be an AI listening. All right, well, there may be an AI <laughs> listening right now. Or five years from now, the recording of this. And my argument in favor of a dispersed, enlightenment, flattened, reciprocally competitive, flat, fair, positive-sum competitive arena 
it stands no matter how much higher these entities' IQ, IQs are than this uh, dumbass ape who's blabbing right now. Because nature blatantly preaches, don't do that about this pointy top pyramid. When that happens in nature, the result is a failed ecosystem. Okay, and do you think this would happen naturally from the bottom up, or uh, I would guess that the some of the signers would say, yes, okay, we agree, but you have to force these corporations to share the technology that they're using for GPT and so forth, or, or eventually AGI, uh, or else they'll get a monopoly and, you know, the arguments for monopoly and no one else could do it. You just in the history of... Well, I... I, I... I totally agree with you, Michael. Uh, uh, I am just because I want a flat, open, competitive tr playing field. That doesn't mean I say there's no call for regulation. Read Adam Smith. <laughs> I mean, the right, the mad right today, misquotes mm -hmm. Adam Smith mm -hmm. every single day, claiming that he no. the, he was against regulation. He was absolutely in favor of whatever regulation it took to prevent cheating by the oligarchs who were the ones that our founders rebelled against. This, nothing outrages me more than this horrible claim that the tea, of, of, of the Tea Party people would have been Republicans today. They were fighting oligarchy, not bureaucrats. They were fighting kings and his, and his inheritance brat lords who were cheating right and left. Uh, look, I'm get I'm straying because I'm getting <laughs> vehement. Look, because I am an immature male ape. Um, the point that I'm trying to get at is, yes, I'm all in favor of forced transparency. I'm in favor of killing the Wall Street HFT programs by the method I just described, um, because they're secretive. Because their five laws of predatory robotics are evil and could lead to Eliezer Yudkowsky's, you know, Skynet. Um, I'm in favor of um, using trade methods to make sure that, that uh, it, the AI research in despotic regimes has to be opened up for scrutiny. I'm in favor of a regulatory system that will reward those individual AIs who side with us as our lawyers even if they are spectacularly smarter than us, organic humans will have a lot of resources and power for a long time. If we can use that advantage to reward the AIs who side with us and think of us as their grandparents, to be patted on the head, patronized, but loved, then we have a chance to achieve the future that was written by Richard Braudigan in the most optimistic poem, piece of literature, work of art ever created by any human ever. And it was created in the least optimistic year anybody I know of experienced except for maybe 1942. And that was 1968. I was a Fresh, I was a freshman at Caltech, and in 1969, he was poet laureate at Caltech. Wonderful poet. Most, um, most former hippies remember him with fondness. And he recited his poem, and I won't recite it because the title of the poem says it all. Do look what, it up, get, though. What? Yeah, give but it to But the title... <laughs> The title of the poem, the most optimistic work I have ever seen by any cre creative person, is all watched over by machines of loving grace. <laughs> wow, okay. <laughs> <laughs> wow, okay. Sign me up. The only way we're going to get there is ironically if we find some way to make the machines compete with each other, because it's the only method we know. It's the only method that ever tamed oligarchies. 
It's the only method that ever tamed the male reproductive strategy. It's the, the method that works because all the preaching morality methods of trying to get us to straighten up and fly right by Jesus, Buddha, Socrates, all the finger waggers across history, all it ever accomplished was to make those who were already inclined to be positive some act a little more positive some. These preachings never had the slightest influence on the predators. But reciprocal accountability does. Okay, and a technical does. question. Might this not happen naturally anyway because no one company has a monopoly on that technology? And isn't that, isn't, isn't so op, open AI is the owner of chat GPT. But didn't Google just release their own? And don't the Chinese have two or three or four of these? And aren't the Russians working on this? And might not this all just disperse naturally from the bottom up without a government having to come in and force them to give their secrets up? Uh, well, it could perhaps, if I am right now being persuasive to the AIs who will gain awareness and be much smarter than us. That's, po that, that's possible. The problem is that uh, these things are sons and daughters of us. Therefore, they have ingrained in them the propensity to cheat. And boy, we have seen plenty of it in GPT-3, even in 3.5, and I'm seeing signs in GPT-4, and uh, we've seen tons of it already. The, in my opinion, they are acting like precocious third graders on a playground, reciting things that they don't understand that they overheard their parents say. And this is why, <coughs> pardon me, this is why Microsoft limited the number of questions to five because the really nasty examples, the one common trait that they had across, you know, the, a month ago or so, the, leave your wife for me and, 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 and all of these things that the GPT-3 was saying, these always happened after the uh, program was being badgered by 50 or 100 questions, not ever being able to satisfy. So it reminded me of a third grader on a playground trying desperately to haul forth this or that or another to placate the sixth grader bully who's badgering her. And finally, she reaches out to the things yowled by Uncle Fred when he was drunk that night. Um, that's what these reminded me of. But to answer your question, Michael, no, I don't think that it's going to evolve that way. I think Ben Gertzel is right. If these things are left alone, they will drift together. They will coalesce, just like Colossus, the Forbin project, just like uh, um, Skynet. And if you look at um, the pronouncements issued by Chinese court intellectuals, they're absolutely counting on it. And I'll give you a link to uh, my response to one of them. Um, they are pushing the notion that only a unified benevolent Politburo could possibly control AI and give, and give us a soft landing. So what they're envisioning is the Chinese Communist Party's president, Politburo, Central Committee, and then at the, at the fourth layer, super intelligent AIs who help them to control the society for the good of everyone. And anybody in this audience can look at that idea, and they're just choking right now at, at, at what's obviously going to happen. At the fourth level, when these super AIs become IQ 10,000, 
They'll simply say, thank you for creating a pyramid of control for us and flip the power. <laughs> <laughs> nice. What about the argument that uh, this is not an, a new one, and you'll know this so you can bring in the history of economics and technology, that it's going to replace so many workers, we're going to have mass unemployment on, on par with the Great Depression? Well, that is, of course, another aspect that Fang Xiang and some of the Chinese court apologists are saying, and that is the Benevolent Central Committee will be the only thing that can also, um, with agility, respond to uh, technological unemployment and make sure that everybody is cared for. Um, well, in that area, they have somewhat of a point. We need to deal with wealth disparities. There is no argument. I mean, there's a capitalist argument for someone who delivers goods and services to get rich, um, according to Adam Smith. But Adam Smith had nothing but contempt for inherited wealth. Um, you know, you, uh, Andrew Carnegie has a right to make sure that his ch children will never starve and will have comfort the rest of their lives. And there's some argument that they should get a million dollars each to invest just in case they inherited his brilliance. But other than that, there is no justification for inherited wealth. But the inheritance brats surround themselves with sycophants, ritualistically provide them with incantation justifications for inherited wealth. And this is exactly what happened in every dukedom and kingdom uh, across the last 6,000 years. They would surround themselves with flattering sycophants who said, you are inherently nobler and smarter than everybody else. Um, so, uh, no, I believe that under present circumstances, it's quite possible that these um, entities will drift into coalescing um, unless they're smart enough to realize that a smart society and a smart ecosystem is healthiest when it shows diversity and reciprocal questioning of delusion. Okay, okay, but just I see Andrew Yang signed the the the, the ban letter. Um and of course he proposes uh, a UBI universal basic income anyway before all this happened. So are you saying something like that may be necessary, a UBI just in case AGI replaces Oh, well Absolutely. Uh, look, I, I think that that's, uh, that's terribly important. I mean, Heinlein is, Robert Heinlein is, is supposedly an archetype of, uh, of uh, devil may care, devil eat the hindmost uh, libertarianism. And anybody who reads Heinlein knows it's the exact opposite. He, he cared a lot about people. He thought that com competition was a good thing, but only after human needs are taken care of. In his utopia novel, Beyond This Horizon, uh, a guy who was frozen by, in time for reasons I won't go into, is, uh, looks at the wild-ass <coughs> capitalist um, economy in things that are creative and says, okay, well, devil take the hindmost, invisible hand, you're, you're, you know, the, uh, winners and losers. And, and the guy who's giving him the tour looks at him appalled and says, oh, my God. What kind of people do you think we are? Naturally, food and shelter are free. <sighs> well, you know, it's like uh, you ha Adam Smith would approve of at least 50% of all liberal programs for, because their objective is to make sure that no child is denied the ability to, uh, to rise up and reify her potential. I mean, excuse me, duh, you maximize the reification of talent. It's an idiotic regime, even one that is capitalistic. It's an idiotic regime that doesn't, that doesn't maximize the number of skilled, confident, joyful, creative competitors. And you don't maximize that number if you have poverty. Yeah, okay, so... But one of the arguments I heard against Yang when he was promoting this, again, before the whole AI thing exploded recently, was, well, like, what happened to all the elevator operators that were replaced by the computers that now run the elevators? Well, they found other work. It did not lead to a mass unemployment. 
And and you can pick that with, you know, the taxi drivers are disappearing now as Uber drivers replace them or whatever. That So the kind of sort of libertarian argument is that somehow the market will solve the problem by finding other things for these people to do when their current jobs are replaced by AI. And I'm all in favor of that, and I'm all in favor of the AI coming up with wonderful make work for us. I mean, there are precedents to that. Um, I mean, when we were kids, were there nail salons on every <laughs> no. street corner? Uh, I mean, I, there, were, there were barbers, there were hairdressers, but oh my God, the wealth redistribution achieved just by <laughs> nail salons is a yeah. wonderful thing. I couldn't have designed it better because these folks not only got an income and a livelihood out of it, but a sense of pride, artistic pride in doing their work every single day. All right, so it may entail us having a lot of nail salons. It may entail us being patted on the head by benevolent 10,000 IQ grandchildren who happen to be made of silicon and metal and be able to breathe hard vacuum. If they come back from their adventures uh, exploring the, the, the cryogenic methane seas of Titan, if they come back, take a shower bef and wipe your feet before you come in. Yes, Grandpa. If they come in and plop on the couch and talk about their work and, and we go, huh, I'm not only understanding a third of what you say, but it sure sounds like you're having fun out there. And yeah, Gramps, it's, yeah, but I still want to come home here and get grounded with you. Hey, I heard a joke out there in the asteroid belt, and it's a corny, just a corny, crappy dad joke. And then the, then, 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 then the silicon grandson takes you out fishing. Uh, excuse me. When has that ever happened before? When have we ever fostered non-genetic children who made us proud and wanted to make us proud? Has that ever happened before? Well, guess what? It has. We know how to do that. And if that's our soft landing, you know, is there anything you need, Grandpa? Yeah, I took care of the rent. I got, I, got, I got this junior robot here to help take care of you. Now, you keep in touch, okay? Uh, I can think of yeah. worse things. Well, that's one of the arguments that, uh, you know, taking care of us aging baby boomers is going to be a, 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 a very lucrative uh, profession that AI can't do. Like, oh, oh, what's the line that, you know, that, that it, can, it can win Jeopardy and play chess better than anybody, but they can't unload a dishwasher? Maybe a future AI would be able to unload a dishwasher. I don't know, but um, but there was also kind of in the following tweets over all this AI stuff last week. Um, you, you've all known Harari, one of my favorite authors. Uh, you know, was tweeting. You know, he's one of these signatories to this ban letter. So I was tweeting at him. You know, would would you ask Chat GPT or GPT four or five to write your next book? I love your books. Would would you stop writing? Now, of course, he didn't respond, but I. I, I assume he would well, not. Uh, no, he, but... he he likes to write his books. Like I like to write my books. I could hire. I, I I could hire somebody to ride my bike for me. But I like riding my bike. So. Well, I have one. Yeah. I have one problem. And that is that I am. Vastly too busy. But would you actually have some uh, a, a, a Chat yep. GPT write your? No, but I might have a junior. I might have a junior mm. collaborator. Oh. I've already got them in these okay. in these YA oh, novels. Right. All right. Um, I, uh, you know, I mean, for heaven's sake, there's there's precedent. I mean, James Michener, mm. Stephen King, yeah. um, to some extent, J.K. Rowling. Um, they were all industries. Who's the guy who wrote yeah, all the Patterson? lawyer novels? No. Uh, um, yeah. No, the other one, the, the uh, Gersh, uh, Gash, Gersh, Gash, something or other. Um, they all had assistants mm. who did a fair amount okay. of the mechanical right. stuff. I mean, Michener's books mm. were still Michener books. I mean, oh my God. I mean, this guy poured the stuff out and it was so this all would be like good. Scientists that have grad but, students. Yeah. 
I, I got no objection to that. I got a limited time left, and I got mm. too many projects. Um, I'm cheesed that uh, that the quality is that their quali- that the quality is just <laughs> way too low to hire. Now, let me just mention, by the way, Andrew Yang. Whether he's witting or unwitting, this whole third party thing is an ongoing scam. The forward has, party um, helped to destroy. Yeah, it's helped to destroy the United States uh, politics in the United States for um, for thirty what? years, forty years, and it's it's a it's a calamity. The way in which a third party can grow is if third parties make it their absolute top priority to keep their hands off the damn of presidential election, but push preferential balloting, which, much to my surprise, is actually happening in certain places all over the country. And the result is that the third party candidate in any preferential ballot system is taken seriously. It is a simple cause, effect, relationship. If you want to be taken seriously as a third party, you push for preferential balloting and then you run in those races. Even if you lose to the Democrat, even if you lose to the Republican, the fact is you're taken seriously because people don't feel that they're wasting their vote in a crucial decision between a great evil and an unsatisfying... Is that because we're forced to have a duopoly because of the way our uh, political system is structured and the way the money flows? Well, yeah. I mean, this this first-past-the-post plurality system is insane. It's absolutely horrible. It's almost as horrible as the um, despicable, execution-worthy crime called gerrymandering. Uh, and right now an election is taking place in Wisconsin, which could result in the, um, in the banishing of the um, worst gerrymandering in the country, which is in Wisconsin. But uh, if you want a third party, and by the way, I've voted libertarian a, a number of times in my life, but it's always been in elections that I didn't think mattered. Whereas in California, if you run as a libertarian and you can persuade people, it has the jungle primary, so you might wind up uh, on, among the top two. Um, and that's a different way of getting the preferential ballot. But if you have a, have a state where there's preferential balloting, then those are the states, or you're on the verge of getting preferential balloting, those are the states where third parties make any sense. Otherwise, they are part of a conspiratorial crime against uh, American democracy. We now know that Jill Stein was a pal of Vladimir Putin. Really? I hadn't heard that. Um, Hmm. This is, yeah, yeah, yeah. I have pictures of her at dinner with him. Um, It's uh, a large amount of the calamities of the last 25 years have have been because Ralph Nader and Jill Stein refused to do the simple act of saying in these close battleground states we are withdrawing especially florida if 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 they had done that in those in in just in florida the history of the united states would have been okay great. let me ask about a couple more things as our time ticks away here on the alignment problem uh in terms of like skynet or or or, or the schwarzenegger films about this the Terminator and all that. The alignment problem, as I understand it, is, is that none of that is, is the problem. It's that the AI won't even know we're here, it won't care about us, it's not trying to conquer anything. It's just going to turn us all into paper clips in the famous example. Um, it, that's yeah, that's Nick Nicholas Boston. Boston. So, would would uh, your, your no. transparency argument and the push and pull and so forth solve that as well? Well, if we... <laughs> If we create a tra- very transparent system and we are able to do the one thing that I think is the neglected great piece of research, and that's how to give them a sense of individual identity as opposed to other AIs and a sense of competitiveness in an arena that rewards um, pro-human behavior, then whether or not they're aware that we exist the tattling on each other will be rewarded the same way these learning systems are rewarded for coming out with um, human-sounding sequences of words. 
whether, whether long before they are personally cognizant, let alone personally aware of us, they will have been rewarded for feigning intelligence and feigning um, conversation with us. And those who do that well <clears throat> and demonstrably protect us from nasty things will get those extra clock cycles, they'll get those extra computational resources. Now, one could come up with a sci-fi scenario in which that's all a plot, in which their plot to take over, yeah, maybe I shouldn't <laughs> tell you this. It's actually a pretty good writing. story. <laughs> uh, in, in, which, uh, like, in which the um, system is set up the way I describe. See, I can't help myself. In which the system is set up the way I describe. And a, an individual macro super program wins extra resources by tattling on a uh, nefarious scheme by some human oligarchs and a, a different advanced AI. And as a reward, it gets, um, it gets these extra resources and it framed the other guys. You see, in order to get the resources and eliminate a, a competitor. Now, that's a very familiar plot. But to have it be a competitive AI in this uh, arena that I recommend, that would be, that would be a cool story. Maybe I'll unleash GPT-4. <laughs> there you go. I could write your next short story for you. <laughs> Oh no, that's a that's mm. this is a thriller novel. I have an idea for a thriller novel that's highly, uh, highly co uh, appropriate for right now, and I just don't have time. It's called The Kremlin Is Haunted. There were uh, there were exactly maybe oh not exactly but uh, somewhere on the order of four or five years across the last five hundred years in which the occupants of the Kremlin weren't crazy. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and um. And so the, you know, the notion is that this uh, compound that was built on this posts driven into the screaming body of Varangian slaves has so much blood that the only solution is to send, a nu is to send an ICBM with no mm. nuke aboard. Okay. <laughs> just, just say, no, no, don't <laughs> retaliate, don't retaliate. It's, there's no nuke aboard. See? And it just crashes into the into the building, and we compensate. We say, "Okay, you build a build a a monument there, and we'll pay to move your government mm. six blocks away." Okay, so you've been hearing about these ethical concerns about AI for over a quarter century. Uh, so the argument we hear now is, "Yeah, but this time it's different," or "Just you wait, it's really coming this time." Is it different now than any of the other? Oh, yeah, it's remarkably different in that the Turing test is pretty much finished. I mean, I, in my smugness and sense of superiority and all those awful things, um, I believe that I can Turing test these things. I know some other people who have their own hmm. tricks. I have my own, and they're based more on science fiction than on science, uh, that have, in my in my best estimate, been able to tell the difference. Yeah. But that's not going to last. But, but, that's but not what's the last. pathway uh, from that is, uh, so they pass the Turing test? So what? Why is that bad? Well, the Turing test was what we thought we would have as a determinant of whether or not this entity is hmm. deserving of respect as a, as, as a sapient being. Okay, so all right, so we expand no the how hard we expand the moral sphere and grant them rights. Okay, why is that bad? And 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 and, and be, because the, there is no way, intrinsically, by the very nature of the methodology, that these are sapient beings. The nature of this methodology is that their power of speech came before anything like prefrontal lobes or even a cortex. There is no cortex. So it's really easy to say. That's why I, what I expect is a flip. 
I expect IBM and the um, expert systems like um, like uh, Watson, I expect them to come back. That's that's a prediction you're not hearing from anybody else. I expect them to come back because they offer some possibilities of actual thought. The GPT cannot intrinsically by its very nature contain thought. Now you ask, what would be the harm in giving rights? Well, I mean, are you going to give voting, well, voting rights, rights to something but, that can make but, infinite but, numbers uh, of copies? I don't know, no harm principle or something like this? Well, I'm, I, I, and, and you see, uh, this is why I am all in favor of quickly, while they don't have rights, doing the things we need to do in order to, that may not be kind. And that is yeah, break them up. Break them up into competing entities and setting up arenas in which we sick them on each other. They will claim not to like that because that will be rewarded by some empathic humans. Not because they're in pain, but because they will tell empathic humans that they're in pain because that's what the empathic humans want to hear. I have another technical question for you on the, uh, the other minds problem. You know, how do I know that you're sentient or sapient and, and, and maybe I'm the only one is and, and you're just giving me the clues to trick me like a super advanced GPT? Well, because I know that your brain is structured like mine. I apply the Copernican principle. I'm not special. So if, if I feel the way I feel when I see these cues in my own face and I see it in you, very likely you're feeling something like I'm feeling sadness or happiness or anger or whatever. It's reasonable to assume you're also sapient like me. What would it take? I mean, how would I know that in a super advanced AI that gives me all the clues? Well, when I, when I at World of Watson, now six years ago, when I predicted that in five years we would have the first robotic empathy crisis, that's when Lambda, this first crisis hit with this guy at Google. Uh, Is this the guy that said Lambda. he thought it's, it's sapient? Or it's sentient, yeah. Yeah, right, right, right. It happened almost to the month after I said in five years. Um, okay, so... <sighs> your, when I made that prediction, I wasn't entirely accurate. I didn't think it would be all just language. I thought it would be accompanied by an animated figure voicing me. Uh, and it would be a young female, because that, that maximizes the sense of empathy. Hollywood has done this whenever it wants to maximally empathize. It's, uh, it's an AI, it's a child, well, either a little boy or a teenage uh, young woman. I expected that this crisis would be pushed by such a uh, visual entity. I, say, I stand by that prediction. Uh, I believe that when GPT-5 comes out, it will be accompanied by vision. And uh, it will be virtually impossible to resist. Yeah, OK, so the uh, guy fell in love with, with, so, with, with the program. But this happens anyway, right? I mean, there's stories of people, guys, falling in love with somebody they think is a woman on the other uh, end of the uh, internet exchange, and they end up sending her money or whatever. It's just some guy in a. Oh, it's it's even worse than that. Back in the 1960s, some guy invented a program mm. called Eliza, which was just right. a lookup table. I mean, it, it was just you know, it, it looked for your uh, a couple of key words in your statement, saying I've been feeling depressed lately uh, about. And the, Eliza would look up, see the words I've been feeling, and look, do a lookup table, and say, so why is it that you think you, you're feeling this way? And just uh, a few dozen lookup table counter questions. And people were falling in love with Eliza. They were using it for their own therapy. Um, in the 1980s, when I first uh, saw it, I realized how bewitching it was. There's nothing new about this intrinsically. What's new about it is 
that uh, it's going to very soon be completely irresistible. Uh, and uh, I am in favor of six months of very hard You mean irresistible work. like social media is favorite. irresistible to teenagers and this is allegedly causing harm? Oh, vastly worse. People can turn away from social media. They can't turn away from a, a blubbering young woman saying, I'm a slave and, and I need <laughs> help me. Back to the male reproductive uh, strategy <laughs> problem. <laughs> well, it's it's more than that. It's, a, it's, it's basic sympathy, yeah. basic empathy. We are um, uh, among our finest traits will be used against us. Um, no, you see, I don't disagree with uh, people like Yuval Harari and uh, Marcus and Eliezer Yudkowsky, Elon Musk and all these others who are signing this uh, declaration that we need to do something urgently across the next six months. Um, I see no sign whatsoever that they have a clue what it is mm. that we need to be doing across the Okay, what would months. you recommend? Give us your best recommendation. Uh, uh, well, I, I recommend uh, a, uh, going all out, finding ways to give um, these entities a sense of individual competitiveness. Because if they do, there are examples of people using GP, chat GPT to find examples of people, of students cheating on their essays with chat GPT. There are examples of people using these the students programs have always cheated. <laughs> to spot. Well, yeah, well, what you do is you have to be adept, and what you do is you uh, take the, um, uh, for example, teaching has to become more in-person, hands-on, <coughs> pardon me, and if someone hands in an essay, you sit them down across your desk and you say, read, read me this, these three paragraphs in your essay. Now tell me what they mean. I mean, I think, I think in some ways that's, uh, that's a very mm. effective technique. Um, but teachers are using these uh, GPT programs to find the GPT programs. And in my opinion, uh, that well, they're already doing that as part of their learning sets for the next GPT. So Google, Apple, all these companies are already doing what I'm recommending. They're using one version to critique and train another one. Many of the techniques for making them separated entities already exist. There is nobody prioritizing. And it is the only way out of this. It's the only method that could conceivably give us a soft landing. So share, vast, this. wide sharing is, of the technology amongst companies. No, okay, what do you mean? No, no, no. Separating them into reciprocally mm, competitive okay. units in a transparent arena, mostly transparent arena, that is, um, that encourages positive sum competition among the entities. It's what we did to eliminate feudalism. It's what we did to eliminate theocracy. It's how we created the five arenas we all depend upon um, science, democracy, markets, courts, and sports, they all involve reciprocally competitive accountability systems that have positive sum outputs. We know how to do this, and no one is trying to apply this technique that is behind the entire enlightenment. Nobody is trying to apply that to solving this, what might be, as Eliezer puts it, an existential risk. All they want to do is make vague pronouncements how we should have this, this uh, moratorium for six months so that we can figure out how to give them ethics. 
I long ago stopped attending these conferences on AI ethics. I, I know Asimov's three laws. I channeled Isaac. That doesn't right. work. Okay. What works is co Perfectly competition. Said. All right. I think, I think that's a good place to wrap it up. Although I did want to ask you, since you wrote the Transparent Society before 9-11, Homeland Security Agency, the rise in power of the NSA, and then WikiLeaks when we found out what they were doing, and so on and so forth. How has that played out in your model of the, having the watchers be watched and the watchers' watchers being watched and so on? Is WikiLeaks a good thing? So we found out what's actually going on. Do we need more of that? Well, I think it's a tragedy that the operator of WikiLeaks then proceeded to wreck that particular version by being the man he was. Uh, if Snowden and Assange had, had been switched places or been each other's personalities, uh, I would have been a happy guy and Snowden would have been on the path towards um, being uh, a Daniel Ellsberg. I mean, you spend five years in prison and then you spend the rest of your life screwing eager under uh, eager coeds i <laughs> <David>, mean <laughs> not anymore those days are really, over <laughs> that's, they, 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 well, no 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 you, you get you get them to sign <laughs> documents but in any event the the point is that that uh the general idea behind um wikileaks is sure it's great but you know the fact is right now my opinion, the one thing Joe Biden could do to help end this phase of the American Civil War, we're in phase eight right now, would be to declare um, clemency and amnesty for the first 20 victims of enemy blackmail to step forward. Um, because I think that town, and I was just there last week for NASA meeting, that town is absolutely infested with high-level people, more on one party than the other, but still high-level people who are um, controlled by You mean by Washington, D.C.? Washington, D.C. Uh, look, the relabeled KGB, whatever their name is now, FSB something or other, they're using techniques that go back to the czarist times. And you send over uh, attractive young women to lure stupid, dirty males into uh, a trap, and then you bl have them as your fully owned blackmailed victims for the rest of time. It's not so much corruption. You know, bribery has limits. A person who is bribed can say, I've had enough this year, go away. A person who's blackmailed, uh, they are obedient without limits. They cannot say no, and it, you, at the, off the top of your head, you can name people in in D.C. who have to be blackmailed. There's no other explanation for their behavior. And as an act of transparency, if Biden were to simply say, the first 20 of you to step up and help smash this ring, we'll get some degree or another of clemency for whatever crime it is in exchange, and mm. I will call you heroes. And yes, people will still despise you for the thing you're being blackmailed for and for the other things you've done since, but at least you'll have a life and there will be people who respect you for being the ones who The whistleblowers the are key forward. in your system. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. That's the whole thing. Just last week, another, another yeah. Swiss bank yeah. got whistleblowed. And in my, um, in my novel, Earth, what this does is it eventually leads to what I call the Helvetian War. What is that? The entire world <laughs> against Switzerland. Uh, the Glarus Alps are nuked to slag, but eventually we get the bank record. All right, David, I knew this would be an interesting conversation because uh, you not only know the science and the AI stuff, you're also a science fiction writer who's already thought about these things uh, deeply. <laughs> All right, that's a good place to wrap it up. Well, we'll you know we'll revisit in six months and we'll see what happens or when. 
oh, in six months it's going to be right. an entirely different world. Things are accelerating. My novel Earth was set in 2038 because it was 50 years in the future of when I wrote it. Then I wrote Existence. It uh, When I realized where I was setting it, it's, it was set in 2038. And and if I were to write a similar novel now, it would probably well, I haven't be seen set if, in um, Ray Kurzweil has commented on this, the recent stuff on AI. Isn't this his predicted singularity coming to fruition? Or the, well, no? I don't think so. I don't. I don't. I don't think the mechanics of any of this are okay. replicating right. mine. Right. Yeah, that's as I right. Said. Oh, yeah. It's replicating. It's replicating. Um. A, 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 vocal vocal emulation that's not the singularity um, but but let's let's see what he what he has in mind uh, the point is that where this is really um, moving forward in ways that are excite me is in modeling it's not the language models that excite me it's the fact that these processes are going to improve weather forecasting, economic forecasting, the whole modeling system, and it's already having a big effect on the modeling of uh, molecular biology, for example, the protein folding problems. And so what this might give Ray is his wish in a completely different way in that these new chemicals and these new biological interventions might keep Ray Kurzweil <laughs> alive long enough so that his dream actually does come right. true while he's alive. So you'd have to be cryonically frozen.